Good afternoon, everyone. Are you having a good day? Yes. Great. So I'm Martin Francesc. I'm going to talk to you about what we could do with data, principally. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about what we could do with data, and I'll say a couple of words about what, what we're doing at JISC right now using data and analytics to help learners and to help the, the staff that support them. So, without further ado, let's kick off. I've split this into four chunks, and I thought you probably would benefit from a little bit at the beginning just to say, who, who the heck are we anyway? If you've not come across us before, um, what do we do? And then we'll get on to the, the, the meat of it. Um, so if you've not come across us before, um, we run digital infrastructure for HG and FE. We do quite a bit of that. Things like the Janet Network and Eduroam. So if you're from the academic side, if you're from a university, you probably use Eduroam, you probably use Janet every day without really thinking about it. It's just, it's just like the air we breathe nowadays. We also do quite a lot of work on deals with publishers, other kinds of deals, uh, things around IT equipment, and this sort of thing, and advice and guidance, and there's a, a few interesting things to say um, in that space, particularly, which I'll, I'll try and talk about today. Um, who do we do this for? Well, we, we do this for pretty much all the universities and colleges. We also connect about half the schools in the UK to the internet, so we've got about 18 million users, and that includes some of you guys, but not all of you. So. What I think is very interesting is when you have a conversation that involves uh, folk who are working on the NHS side of health education, invariably you're also talking to people who are working on the university and college side, and there are all sorts of gaps, there are all sorts of places where things don't quite join up, and that's particularly true when we look at data. So, what can we do with data? Uh, this is the thing that we've just launched. We spent about three years building this. This is our uh, learning analytics service. We just signed our, our first country up to this, which is quite good. So Wales, the entire nation of Wales, all the Welsh universities are using this service now, and we're, we're quite pleased about that. So now it's like, right, okay, what, what could, nation could we sign up next? But what does this do? All of those sorts of things that you've been hearing about just now from uh, Neil, the e-learning systems that people interact with every day, but actually potentially quite a few other things, generate a, a data trail. They generate a, a digital exhaust, if you like. And historically, what's happened is that we've kind of, every now and then we've looked at our servers and our hard drives and gone, poof, damn. Old things filling up. What is all this stuff? Ah, log files, data and stuff. What, what should we do? Oh, well, let's get rid of those. It's just using up space. Learning analytics is all about saying, actually, well, that, that's information. It's not waste. It's information because it tells us somebody has done something. Somebody has engaged with the material. Somebody's engaged with perhaps an assessment process. But fundamentally, they're, they're doing stuff, they're interacting with the systems that we've put in place to support their learning. What happens when they stop engaging? And this is where the, the learning analytics approach is very, very interesting. So we're looking at things like virtual learning environments, library systems, attendance monitoring. When people stop interacting with those systems, or when the patterns change, or when they start to disengage, that is when we're best placed to get in there and say, we need to have a chat, we need to have words. So we heard about robots and artificial intelligence earlier on, and that's all very interesting, but this is really about people. It's about taking the data that comes out of those systems, crunching it in a central data hub, and then exposing that in a variety of ways. So if you're the learner, you can say, well, actually, you know, how, how, how am I comparing with my peers? You know, am I, am I falling behind a bit here? Maybe I should set myself some goals. And, you know, goals, for a typical undergrad, goals might be something like visit the library three times a week. 
you know, spend an hour a night reading, this kind of thing. But also expose that to personal tutors, to departmental administrators, so they get an advance warning of if there's a problem developing. So that's how we're using learning analytics. Um, it's, it's, looking, it's looking like it's going to be really popular. And I say we spent three years working on this. We're understandably we're quite excited about it. Where does that fit into the bigger picture? Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing is surveying students. So we do one of the largest surveys of students all around their digital experience. So basically, how is how is their institution's use of technology actually helping or hindering them? And that's part of this thing that we call our digital insights service. So we're looking at digital in teaching and learning, but also in the lives, in the day-to-day -day lives of students. So increasingly, you know, there's stuff that you have to interact with because it's part of your teaching and learning experience. And then there's a bunch of stuff that you engage with kind of incidentally. We were talking earlier on about social media. A lot of people, uh, before they even come to university, they'll join a pre-session or Facebook group or something like that. Or they might say, well, <laughs> come on, Facebook, that's just for old people, right? <laughs> you know, there's no way you can't have to be seen dead on Facebook. So there's a lot of those interesting kind of questions. We got uh, nearly 38,000 students from the UK uh, respond to the, the latest version of this survey. We just published the results from it. And that's 16% of UK colleges 30% of UK universities we've got a return from. So it's quite a good snapshot of what people think of digital in the round. So like I say, not just teaching and learning, it's kind of the, the, the whole thing. Um, and when we look at the whole thing, actually, there's a quite profound conclusion. Only 41% of those students <laughs> felt that the technology that had been used on their course at their institution actually prepared them for the world of work that they were going to enter when they finished. And this is at the time, if you, if you look at uh, British Chambers of Commerce, they've recently published a survey which says around 75% of employers uh, feel that digital skills are absolutely crucial to their workforce. So there's a, there's a digital skills mismatch going on there. What we don't have right now, or maybe we can do a slice through the data to find this out, we don't have a kind of per, um, per discipline, per domain view of this yet. I think it'd be quite interesting to develop one. You know, if you're, if you're a learner in the healthcare and allied subjects, how does that differ from a learner who's doing humanities, someone who's doing engineering? But it, it was very telling. I mean, we, we, were, we were honored to get a, a foreword on our report from uh, Sangima, the minister responsible for, for universities, who essentially said, get your act together, this isn't good enough. Um, we want to do everything we can to support our members in improving that situation. So just monitoring it, monitoring it in the first place has told us that there's a little bit of a, a problem there and there are lots of ways that we can do something about that. So let's Let's see what some of those could be. A big one for us is um, about helping staff to build their digital capability. And I think in HEE, you have a, a version of this. Our digital capability toolkit is a, like an open access uh, piece of uh, resource that you can take away and you can customize and you can use. One of the things that's been uh, particularly popular is a discovery tool which lets you quantify your uh, kind of digital nabs. What areas of technology are you more or less engaged in? And what we see is that there are a lot of people who are, uh, we would say they're residents in some areas. Maybe they're Facebook. And I'm on there every day. And then there are other areas that they visit occasionally. There's a thing that I have to use from time to time. I wouldn't choose to use it. You know, it's one of those work systems. I don't choose to use it. But maybe actually, if I build up my tolerance for it, if I build up my expertise in it, that's something I'll be able to pass on to the students that I work with and the other staff members that I work with. So I think that, that discovery tool is, is quite a powerful thing. We've got a range of resources there, all under digital capability 
www.jessie.ac.uk which they're, they're free, they're out there, you're welcome to use them and we'd love to know what you do with them. Or maybe there's a, a kind of spin or a take on them that would be useful uh, for you. So I talked about learning analytics and what I talked about so far was really what we've done with it and I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about what could be done next and this is the area that we've just kind of started to really think about. We spent three years building the thing, we've got it out the door. How does it evolve? How does it develop? So for us, one of the really, really big things that we've seen around curricula is, and I'm sure you, you guys are familiar with this as well, you get these kind of peaks and troughs. So you know, there's a, there's a peak there which is just about assimilating a huge amount of new information. Here's three different courses that have been modelled in terms of workload on, on students. What's that big blue block there? That is assessments. So if you think about in an ideal world, you wouldn't reach a critical point on your course and then be totally overwhelmed by assessment, 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 high stakes, summative, you know, You've got to get through this, it's going to be tough. <coughs> Ideally, that would be smeared across the whole of your course. You'd be getting to the end of your course, you'd have accumulated enough points, and you'd be confident that although you had a couple of exams to take, you've got it pretty much in the bag. So if you think about where to stress for the learner, and actually often for um, staff who are involved in supporting them, where does the stress come from? It's when this workload is distributed unevenly, when there are these huge peaks, but it seems like all the assignments are due in, all the exams are next week, you're nodding, <laughs> you've been going through this, right? And there's another uh, wrinkle on this, which is um, about employability. So are we, are we doing the right things? Are we building up our profile, building up the, the sort of CV that will help us to be more employable as learners when we finish our course? So I think there's something in here as well. You don't want to be an unemployed graduate with that you know, maintenance loan debt hanging over you. So if we use data and analytics to help you build up that profile. And we think that there's an awful lot that can be done. I talked about attendance monitoring, virtual learning environments, but actually increasingly our whole campuses are being uh, connected. So we're connecting even sensors in rooms, we're connecting things like car parking spaces, and there's a lot more that we could do with that. If we know that you, particularly, you always arrive on campus and then spend half an hour looking for a parking space, and you know, there's a sort of trope that students are all 18 years old and don't have any mortgages or family or anything like that, and of course that's simply not true. A lot of people have commitments. Let's say you've got to do a school run, then you get to campus, ah, there's no one left to park. Always happens. If we actually use that information, if we gather that information and we use it sensibly, then we can support you as a learner and give you options, give you, um, you know, some wiggle room, give you some flexibility. It may simply be that we shouldn't be starting that course, we shouldn't be starting that lecture at nine o'clock on a Monday morning. I know that's always a good one to think about. Um, but we'll think about, think about rooms. Now we're in a room today which, it, I know I was in here before and it was completely full. It's getting pretty warm, it's pretty toasty. A lot of rooms, maybe they don't have adequate ventilation. You come in here, you spend a couple of hours in here, uh, carbon dioxide builds up and you start to get a bit sleepy, maybe some people get a headache. Uh, if you actually know what's going on, if you're, particularly if you're the lecturer in this sort of situation, you can take action. You can take some affirmative action. You can say, okay everybody, I know, I know we're in here for two hours. Let's just take a break for ten minutes. Let's just get up, move around, and open the window. But the, the bigger thing, I think, the bigger thing is, as institutions, the institutions can say, we're taking a whole institution view of this. And when you've got an organisation like HEE, it can take a, a systemic <coughs> view of this and it can say, well actually, do you know what? Um, we see people 
who aren't achieving their full potential. And it's not because they're no good, it's not because they're lazy, um, you know, it's not, it, it might be because they can never find a parking space and they're always 10 minutes late for the 9 a.m. lecture on, on Monday, but actually, it could be because they're being taught in a learning space that is just not quite right. It's, it, the lights aren't bright enough, the ventilation isn't good enough, and things like that. So we've got this bit of work we call Intelligent Campus, which is all about trying to join those dots up and help to support that bigger analytics picture. Um, well, we talked about assessment overload earlier on. There's, there's all kinds of ways in which things can go wrong for people. And there's this particularly tragic story here. Um, this guy, James Murray, his son Ben, was a student at Bristol University. He thought everything was going fine. The two of them had met up, I don't know, it was um, maybe just a few days before Ben took his own life. And boom, you know, this, this drops like a lead weight on you. I thought everything was fine. And what um, James has done, which is really changes everything, is James has made a, a, essentially a dashboard, a score sheet, of things that he feels that institutions, and by extension, you know, the um, NHS trusts that um, students are placed in, could know, ought to know, things that they ought to know about their learners. And if we start to actually systematically go through that, you know, there, there will be things that are maybe more specific to one discipline or another, but this is a pretty good start. Have, have we missed some coursework deadlines? Have we not been to lectures much recently? You know, that car parking space, well actually we never even came onto campus. The automatic number plate recognition says that we haven't been in, in our car, which we did every day, reliably, until two weeks ago. When enough of those boxes start to be ticked, when enough of those little blobs start to turn around, we need to do something. So it's, it's a really tragic, tragic story, but I think the idea that, that James Burry has, essentially, is we can do this, and, and if we've got the will, got the will to come together and say, right, we're going to fix this. The data and, and joining the data together is not hard. What's hard is having the will to join up across different silos, across partner organisations, so that we have this composite view of how best to support a learner. I know I'm talking to an audience of librarians here, so a lot of this, you might say, well, this, this kind of falls outside of my sphere of influence, it falls outside my domain. Don't kid yourselves though, remember, um, people going through turnstiles in libraries, people taking books out, people interacting with e-resources, that is all in your domain, and you can do something about that. So, I think there's, there's a lot that we can do to build on that learning analytics approach. Uh, we think that there's, there's something actually much bigger coming along, and, off the back of what's been called the fourth industrial revolution. So at the end of the day, we talked earlier on about AI and robotics. The truth is that there are a whole bunch of technologies which are um, infiltrating our lives on a daily basis. So you know, if you use, say if you use Google Photos, Google Photos automatically classifies your pictures for you. I, I gave it three pictures of one of my kids, and now Google Photos can reliably say, yep, I can find you all those pictures right back to when she was a baby. You know, from yesterday to when she was a baby. So we think about, if you talk about artificial intelligence, there's something that sounds a bit sci-fi. It sounds like it's five, 10, 20 years in the future. But actually, if you look around, it is all around us already. But what we're not doing is we're not necessarily uh, institutionally making the most of it. And some of the stuff I talked around learning analytics, actually we can use some of those AI techniques to do the predictive bit, to say actually someone like you is on course to get a first. Someone like you uh, is, sadly, is on course to disengage and drop out. Maybe we can help you support you. 
So we think that there's a lot in this fourth industrial revolution stuff, and we've actually created a few talking points just to kind of um, have out with people in a workshop type setting. We don't have time in this session today to do that, but it'd be quite fun maybe to come back and do this one day. Um, we talked about, for instance, transforming teaching. Right now, most teaching happens in lecture theatres. Uh, there are some subjects where it's very hands-on and you're in a lab, you're in an operating theatre in some cases. Um, but an awful lot of teaching and learning happens in lecture theatres, which, uh, you know, really that environment hasn't changed for the best part of a thousand years. Can we do it differently? And I'm only going to pick that one example off these bullet points. But think about this, uh, Northampton University has just opened a new campus. They have a complete new campus. Everything is new. Old campus, gone. £330 million pounds to build this new campus. There is one lecture theatre. There's one lecture theatre. So we talk about e-learning, we talk about <coughs> blended learning, we talk about you know, how that can be used to support distance learners and different modes of delivery. What Northampton have done is probably the most courageous thing of any institution that I know of. They've said, actually, it's ready. It, this is ready for prime time. It's now time to say, you know, tiered seating, 250 students in a massive room, the lecture is a little tiny dot in the distance. No, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to make it all blended learning. We're going to use those contact hours for personal contact in small tutorial groups. So will we see a lot more of that? I think we probably will. I'd love to talk to you some more about some of these talking points, but sadly, uh, we're running out of time. Do catch me afterwards, though, if you want to chat. The other thing that we thought was quite profound is actually the uh, sort of civic duty, the civic responsibility that education institutions have. I think this speaks particularly to uh, the library community, because what we've seen with libraries, as local government in the UK has been starved of funding, frankly. Of course, what's happened to the public library system has been a real tragedy. Where there isn't a university, where there's a college, where there's some institution that has a, a very firm grounding in the community, and maybe actually we can find ways to work together, make sure that that public library service keeps going. And uh, if, if any of you have been to Worcester, there's a really fascinating example there, where the University of Worcester have come together with the local council and the library it was called the Hive. The library is a library for everybody. It's not just for the public, it's not just for the students, it's for everybody. So maybe there are a few more examples like that that we can find. But that is it for me. So thank you very much and I'd love to <laughs> go back to the